So let me let me just give you a little update on a few of the things we've been working on. Um, this is the uh, 150th town hall I've held since 2012. Um, we've responded to 168,000 phone calls, emails, letters um, in the last two years alone uh, from the district, of which 59,689 have come out of Jackson County. This is uh, one of many ways that we hear from people. Um, we've also helped nearly 6,000 Jackson County residents with different casework. And I want to put that at the heading because I, at virtually every town hall or public meeting, there are people who have individual cases they'd like help, help on. Medicare, Social Security, VA. And we stand ready to do that. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of that involves, involves privacy issues and forms. So if you can contact our Medford office, um, we are delighted to help. And we do all kinds of, of that work. In July, we helped a, a mother get into the United States. Um, we worked with the State Department uh, to get this woman's mother, who's from the Philippines, proof for entry um, for her graduation and extended stay in our country. Um, we help veterans get backlog cases worked through. Um, and so it's a very important part of the work that all of us do in the congressional delegation. So I just put that at the head end. If you've got something you want to talk about privately, please get a hold of our office. I do have staff here as well. Um, but after this, we go on to, to Klamath Falls for another uh, town hall. I want to open um, by talking about the shutdown. Um, I don't think that workers in these other agencies not affected by border security uh, should be shut down. And that is why I have been uh, willing to break with some of my own party and fund places like the Bureau of Land Management. As well as and, uh, they are important members of our communities. And as I'm out across John Day or Vail or, or Burns, which I'll be later this week, um, we need them back at work doing the job that they want to do and that we need them to do. Um, and that is why I have, have made that distinction. Now, having said that, I also believe a country that does not have control of its borders does not have control of its security. And so I am a founder of border and have supported border security uh, my entire time in the Congress. Now, that can be fencing, that can be high technology, that can be additional border agents, that can be wall. Um, there was a day and time back when the 06 border fence was passed by Congress to build 750 miles of wall across the southern border, that it was bipartisan. Senator Wyden voted for it, Congressman DeFazio voted for it, I voted for it. And along the way, under other presidents, Republican and Democrat, I think most all of us have continued to support different ways to get to border security. I just hope those at the top that are negotiating this can actually negotiate it, get it done, and, and get these agencies back up and running. Let me switch to a couple other things. Um, I think for Southern Oregon, and that's here, it's Klamath and frankly Central Oregon, and all across the dry side of our state, um, we've got to do more to battle these forest fires and to get our forests back in balance. I know flying out last night, completing my 603rd round trip. Um, but I know that Pam Marsh, your state representative out of Ashland, held a forum last night, I believe, uh, talking about this issue. I've certainly done a number of those, and we're all engaged. So we're making some progress federally. Uh, but there is a lot more to be done. Um, we did get some improvements in the farm bill that was passed into law uh, that allows for, for some more proven fire techniques to be used. But if we could bring up that slide on, on the state, um, part, of the, part of the issue when we passed the Farm Bill, um, the prior time, we allowed governors to pick forests where these enhanced uh, management tools could be used. What you see in blue is what I think it was then Governor Kitzhaber chose. What I would, and they work. It's about doing expedited thinning, uh, tree uh, reduction, uh, brush reduction. I think Chris uh, Chambers from the National Fire Department last night said there are stands down here that have 175 trees where there should be 50. We've had OSU forestry professors tell us in Eastern Oregon there are 1,000 trees per acre where there should be 70. Climate change, global warming, uh, density, uh, longer, hotter summers and all. We've got to get in here and manage. So we had a provision in the Farm Bill that say you could use those same proven effective tools that are on the east side on all federal forests. And the point of this slide is we don't get to use those tools down here. And we should be able to. Unfortunately, that didn't get into law. 
We did get some expanded authorities and the landscape treatment uh, legislation I helped write back, I think it was in 03, which is playing out here and in other parts of our districts in Portland. That does good work, but we've got to get ahead of this uh, curve. One of the things we did accomplish was to get rid of the fire borrowing problem. Now, those of you who aren't students of all of this, um, when we have these big fires, the Forest Service raids its other, other accounts in the summer to pay for the current firefighting needs. And then the work that they were going to do doesn't get done. And then Congress comes back and backfills those funds and you repeat the same cycle. Senator Wyden, myself, others have worked together over the years to try and stop that. And we were successful last year in getting legislation passed that says beginning in fiscal year 2020, fire borrowing ends. We'll pay for fires with firefighting funds. And that will leave us more resources to do the kind of forest management work like is being done up in the Ashland watershed and elsewhere. So that did get into law. Now we have a little dispute over another provision. I still believe that after the fire on the federal forest lands, we should be able to go in where appropriate and good for the environment, remove the burned dead trees where, they, where it makes sense and they have value, and replant a new healthy green forest. I just think that makes great stewardship. <laughs> we were also successful uh, in the last Congress in extending the Secure Rural Schools payments. Uh, so for fiscal years 17 and 18, uh, Jackson County received uh, 9.4 million dollars. Uh, these are the funds that we've been able to get um, mostly every year um, through uh, different <laughs> uh, ways uh, into our counties to replace revenue that's no longer generated by timber harvest. Um, so there's more work to be done on forestry. We're happy to talk about that as we get into the q and On uh, things we got done, I, as you know, chair the Energy and Commerce Committee, and I wanted to report that we passed out 148 pieces of legislation. Uh, 57 of those became law, and 93% of our work 93% of the bills that passed the House passed with bipartisan votes. And probably half of them passed unanimously. And the biggest body of our work was on opioids. I'll tell you, um, we lose more Oregonians and more Americans to drug overdose every year than we do in car accidents. And I've met with those that are dealing with their addiction and seeking treatment. I have met with families who have kids that are dealing with it. And I have spent considerable time with those who lost, lost loved ones. And their tragic stories um, were over and over repeated. And they helped affect my vote and others as we work together on this package of legislation. It's now law. And we will bring financial resources into our communities to help with addiction and treatment. We, will ref we are reforming uh, how uh, these drugs are uh, uh, dispensed. Um, our Energy and Commerce Committee Oversight Investigation Subcommittee, I directed them to do an investigation of how we got here. You can find our report, it was issued at the end of December, it's 380 pages long, and really identifies how we got into this mess as a country. From the pharmaceutical companies to the distributors, I had all the CEOs and the distributors under oath before the committee testifying about what their role in this was, and there's obviously much more work to do to hold them accountable. But clearly we are made progress in this area, but there's more to be done. Um, I want to talk about a couple other things and then we'll get into uh, the, the questions. Brownfields legislation. I was just over in Grants Pass at a town hall talking about Brownfields. I'm sure most of you have been to Bend. You know the old mill district? That was a Brownfield site. You get a 16 to 1 rate of return on the federal investment to clean up old sites like that and get them back into use. That law had not been modernized in at least a decade and it was under my committee's jurisdiction. So we took it on. We, we modernized the law, we make it more user-friendly for states and communities, and uh, we passed it unanimously, and that's now in law. We did the same thing with safe drinking water. You think about the tragedy in Detroit, Michigan, with the water in the pipes that was filled with lead, and then we find out it's repeated across the country. That law had not been updated and modernized in more than a decade. And we took that on in a bipartisan way, unanimously reauthorized and uh, added funding for um, safe drinking water. We also have really continued to do our work on veterans. How many veterans do we have in here? We want to give you a special thank you. We will, I'm 
I'm sure we will have our disagreements in philosophy and opinion today, but we would not be able to have forums like this if it weren't for the men and women who have worn our nation's uniform and guaranteed our freedom. So God bless you. And you. Uh, we continue to work with uh, Rogue Valley uh, Community and Veteran Outreach and Southern Oregon Veterans. Uh, across the map uh, to make sure our clinics are staffed. We, you know, a lot of us in this community worked hard to keep the, uh, the VA facility at White City open. When the Bush administration initially put it up for closure, you see the uh, modernization of that facility, but there's still work to be done. Um, we were successful in a bill I proposed um, to add a pilot project in the VA for medical scribes. What we've learned from the private sector is if you have a medical scribe, someone who is competent and capable to take the notes in a setting, in a, a healthcare setting, they can do basically the data entry so that the physician, the provider doesn't have to do that. It increases the volume of people that can be seen by the medical provider by 59%. When we have the backlog we have at the VA, I think the VA ought to use that kind of concept to be able to expedite treatment for our veterans. That now is in law, it will be a pilot project, and uh, we hope to, uh, to see it play out as well uh, in, the, in the VA system. And we did more with the Mission Act. We're trying to get the backlog down so that our veterans don't have to wait for the care they were promised, and we're continuing to work to see if we can get veterans access to care closer to where they live. Here in the Rogue Valley, we have over 20,000 veterans. And they have access to clinics around here in, the, in uh, White City. But you get out in the eastern parts of our district, and if you're up in Enterprise, you may have to drive to Walla Walla or Boise for basic care. And I think we can do better than that for our veterans. So um, we're working on our, our veteran issues as well. Um, just on a, a couple of final notes. If you're coming to Washington, let us know. We actually did 524 um, family tours this last year. You can go on our website, sign up for that. We're happy to help. And again, if you have casework issues, um, call our Medford office, um, and we're happy to help on that. So with that, thank you again. Let's get to questions. So following a, a random way here, I'm going to call out three tickets at a time. And if you would make your way to the two microphones here, then I'll ask you to identify yourself and ask the questions. So the first one, I think I can just do the last three digits, 166, followed by 201, followed by 171. So first one, these are not door prizes. <laughs> Sorry, 166. You just tell me who you are, where you're from. Thanks. Hi, yeah. My name is Michelle Blum Atkinson. I'm from Medford. Uh, welcome to. Uh, welcome to the Old South Medford, my old school. Um, one thing that you haven't spoken about is housing. So a lot of people who used to go here uh, have moved away for a couple of reasons. The housing prices are very expensive, and the wages have not gone up. Um, what can you do to help us have more affordable housing here yeah. in Southern Oregon uh, as soon as possible? Yeah, thank you. It's a really good question. It's a, it's an important topic. I, <clears throat> there are there are a couple of things. I've done a number of meetings with those involved in housing here in Southern Oregon over the last year. I did a bunch, by the way, during the downturn of the economy when you know you, you're trying to figure out how to keep people in their homes. Uh, a lot of it is driven by state and local. Um, sort of issues as opposed to federal, but clearly there's a federal role to make sure that there are support services um, through the different housing programs to help people be able to afford their rent, and and, and that does uh, through the federal government, and I've been supportive of, of those efforts. But when I talk to those that are in the business of building new homes, uh, building new apartment complex, all that, um, some of them have backed off because of the high cost of land or materials right now. And they basically say, I can build it, but the rents would be so high, nobody could afford to move in in this, uh, this part of Oregon. I'm trying to figure out how to work through that, uh, because we have to reverse it. Uh, but a lot of it is basically state and local driven through um, either zoning or other, other requirements, um, and, and other costs that are put on the base load construction. But I'm open to ideas, because it is a real problem, here and elsewhere, by the way. And so if you've got some suggestions. Well, I just see it as such a safety issue, too, and that is such a role of the federal government. 
Um, so many students here are homeless. You know, they don't have homes, and it's just, it's very sad. It is, and, and you know, I know this school is a bit of a, uh, uh, is focused on helping kids um, really uh, work their way up. Um, and some of them come from situations that are more difficult than perhaps those that some of us came from. And, and I think that's important. And, and the resources here at this school I was learning about uh, before the meeting. Uh, but the housing piece, it's a real problem. And, and I think it is about how do you get that affordability and how do you get more housing stock out there? Um, you, you know, I know some areas are trying rent controls, but my concern with that is that works for a while. But then does that get you the stock you need for the growth? And I'm not sure it does because if you can't get the rate of return, you're not going to build it. And so I, I, will, I would love to sit down and, and work with you and others on, on a strategy going forward. And I know there are groups doing that, but it is, uh, it's a problem. Right, let's yeah. go. Thank you. Um, 201. No 201, okay, then I'm going to draw the next three while well, 171 comes to the microphone. Let me announce these if, if I could, sir. Um, so the next three will be uh, 187, 190, and 200. So 201 is not coming up. Once You're 171. Tell me your name. Alan Journey from Jacksonville. Good morning. Good morning. This president rejected the dire conclusions of the 2018 National Climate Assessment Report written by leading scientists in 13 of his own agencies. <laughs> Meanwhile, the 2018 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change indicated that in order to hold global warming below 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels by 2100, we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 45% by 2030. Thank you for acknowledging global warming as a contributor to our fire risk. But what are you advocating that would promote the 45% greenhouse gas emissions reductions we need? Yeah, thank you. So, I'm actually as the, now the ranking member of the top Republican on the committee, holding round tables with all my Republican members saying we've got to address climate change. I believe in, that the science says it is real. Um, I think we've had thermometers, we can measure it, and we can do something about it. The question is not that we shouldn't do something about it, the question is what should we do about it? And there are a couple of things that have, have happened in the last few years that have continued to put America in the forefront of reducing carbon emissions. And while we went up slightly last year, according to the latest report, um, we went down the year before in 2017. And this year, 18's increase was due to increased manufacturing, not power plants, and a little bit of that because you had more power, but it was the manufacturing sector and it was transportation. Those were the two that seemed to go up. Otherwise, we were down below, I think, at 1992 levels. No country in the Paris Accords in Europe has hit 80% of their targets and most haven't hit 50. But what has allowed us to actually lead the world in reduction in carbon emission is fuel switching. We've taken 16 gigawatts of coal power offline and replaced it with natural gas. But that's worse than coal. It is not worse than coal. Yes, it is. That's you need to we're... understand that it's not the carbon emissions that are the problem, it's the fugitive emissions of methane from the fracking of natural gas. Tell me your replacement power source. Renewable energy. Okay. And... And, I, and I'm, I support renewable energy. I know. And I I've supported, and, and I think you could do a lot more there. And in fact, the, the, here's what we look at right now in Oregon. 17% of our energy, this electricity, comes from natural gas. We still get 32% from coal. Hydro's 40, nuclear's somewhere in that three range, and then the rest are here. So there are studies that show you could do a lot more with hydro across America. All right, And we passed legislation in the last Congress, signed into law, that says these dams that already exist, that don't have hydro, should have an expedited licensing process to be able to do um, hydro development. We did small-scale hydro. So if you're at the Central Oregon Irrigation District, they have 
pressurize the irrigation system, and I helped get them funding for it. And now they have uh, energy generation in there, hydro, it's all sealed up. I think power's equivalent of about 3,000 homes. In Klamath County, they're working on a pump storage project for uh, Swan Lake that I think could power 60,000 homes when it's fully in line. So there are opportunities on solar. Did I get that? No, it is six, oh, 600,000 homes. I was only off by 10x. <laughs> but that tells you the potential that's out there to do these other, other sources of energy. Now, the other piece of this, a lot of the country, a lot of the country relies on nuclear. And I know there's a debate in the environmental community about nuclear. There's a debate in the country about what we do with nuclear waste. And I led the effort in Congress to finally get a permanent and or interim storage. We passed 340 votes in the House. The Senate wouldn't break it loose. But we need to resolve the issues of nuclear storage as well. The nuclear could play a role in this, and there's, there are Oregon companies developing future small-scale nuclear energy development. Zero carbon emissions, zero methane emissions. But you have could, could we focus on greenhouse gases rather than carbon? Sure. But obviously, transportation is a piece of that, right? Um, energy production is a very large piece of that, right? And these fires are a piece of that. The fires are not really much of a contributor. Logging is fire slide. Oh, oh, fire slide. 2018 wildfires. That's the equivalent of a year's worth of energy for electricity for California just from the 2018 fire. So I'm not going to dismiss that. I don't think that's right either. If we're going to have a debate about carbon and reducing carbon, we look at the whole thing. And, and that's this is going to USGS. Let's go to Oregon, 2015 numbers. Three million cars, three and a half coal-fired plants. I, I don't know why you wouldn't be for trying to get our forests in balance so we can- I, I agree those with getting our forests in balance. Okay, but that's we, a piece of We this. need to address global warming to do that. Right, and the IPCC report of 2007 calls for forest management as a tool to exactly. reduce emissions, including fine particulate, including methane and all the other aids that are out there, and carbon. And that's why I've advocated for more aggressive forest management. Not only is it bad for human health, it's bad for, the, for CO2. And by the way, this is probably sequestered carbon right here. It's not all plastic. Actually, only 15% of a tree ends up in timber products. We it's should fix that. Well, if you would allow us to, not you, but it seems to me, in my experience, they use virtually everything in the log, and then you can do the rest in biomass as well. But the log is only the bowl of the tree. There's a lot of carbon in the rest of the tree. Okay, then let's figure out how to use that. Let's, and so my answer is this. America has always led on innovation. We ought to lead on innovation, conservation, and adaptation. I'm not for over-regulation, shut down our economy, and, and go to uh, high taxation. Other, other countries are trying that. It's not working so well for them. We're actually reducing emissions. There's a lot more we can do. I'm committed to doing that. New vehicle technology, uh, autonomous vehicles. I helped write the legislation. didn't get through the Senate. There's a lot we can do. But we can't just pull the plug on all of our baseload power. And, and by the way, there are impacts with wind. There are impacts with, with others. Um, we know that. So I think there's a balance here we can find. I, I agree there is no energy source that is totally benign. We simply have to use the most effective energy source available. But you also have to have base load power. I agree. And I've seen, I've met with Bonneville Power and others, and you know, on the grid, now you get two other issues, by the way. The wind does have a little impact on wildlife, all those turbines, and it certainly affects Buildings them. are a much more dangerous source of birds. It certainly affects them. Let me finish. It certainly affects the view shed. I drive through Eastern Oregon all the time. But I'm not anti wind. I think there's a role for wind. We have enormous geothermal capabilities in the state, but you have to be able to actually go where it is and drill down and get it. And there are a lot of people who want no drilling on federal lands for any reason. But yet we know there's geothermal there. I'll be at, at OIT later today. I helped get them funding for their Renewable Energy Resource Center over the years. 
and the facility that does the, uh, the geo uh, plant there that powers the campus and provides hot water. There are great opportunities here. So there's more to be done. I don't dispute that. But I also think along the way, you've got to look at consumers and rate payers and see what we can do to innovate, afford, and not destroy our economy along the way. So I think there's a balance to be had. Thank you. Uh, the next, I may have gotten these out of order. I have 171, 201, and 166. I did call 187. I don't have 190. Oh, I do have 190 here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to have you here. Um, our biggest thing right tell, now. Can you give me your name? Tell everybody your yep, name. Uh, your... Teresa McGregor. I'm actually a real estate agent at uh, Coldwell Banker. And here a couple years ago, Claudette and I started um, kind of a campaign because we have smoke serious problems here in Jackson County that's affected everybody. And we want to know what you're doing um, to help with this, yeah. and we know there definitely needs to be better forest management. So when, when I grew up here, we had logging, and that was a big difference. We don't have that. And I'm almost wondering if we get the logging back out there, why can't that help with what that other gal asked earlier with, you know, we have the supply, so maybe we can build the homes cheaper if we get that going again, but, can you please help us out here? Yeah, Teresa, thank you. And, and thanks for your work on the committee. So, Todd and I have enjoyed meeting with the, this, I know you've renamed it, I'll call it the Smoke yeah. Committee, because <laughs> it's got a much more, uh, yeah, a different name there. Look, there's, there's a lot that can be done there. Um, I've talked about some of the forestry improvements I think were important. I, I helped write the, the, the legislation came law that sets up the landscape size treatments. Uh, it's the forest emergency, or the, uh, the uh, legislation we did in the Bush administration that the Ashland Watershed is now using, Healthy Forest Restoration Act, expedited tools to get in and get nature back in balance with nature. Because this is the forum last night that Pam Marsh had, they point out the settlers came, we had all these fires on a regular basis, we stopped the fires, but the trees continued to grow. OSU will tell you you got you know a thousand trees where you should have 70. You've got 175 per acre here where you should have 50. Um, we we've, we've got an overstock of, of fuel load. So when we get these fires, and as we have longer fire seasons and the climate changes and all that, you better reduce the fuel load. Or the alternative is these conflagrations that not only don't stop along the habitat and the and the, and the creeks and all. It destroys the airship. So the hearing we did a year ago and last year after these fires in Washington Energy Commerce Congress Committee under the Clean Air Act looked at the human health implications of wildfire. And the human health implications are awful. Mm -hmm. And the individual stories are, are awful. And, and we learned from scientists that there's a range between 2,500 and 25,000 a year that die prematurely from inhaling smoke from wildfires in, the, in America. Yeah. Well, and it's also the long-term consequences well, they don't even know about yet. And then you talk about Shakespeare Festival, 26 yeah. performances. They're not even doing them outside this year, I'm told. You know, they're, they're worried about losing season ticket holders. I mean, all this is going on, and some of this is preventable. We, we, had, uh, we asked people to send us photos of their air filters and all, and this one gentleman, I think it was from Eagle Point, sent, a, sent his CPAP filter after two days of use and it was black. Yeah. And I held it up for my colleagues to see. You see, members on the East Coast, we, we get thunderstorms back there and torrential, torrential rain with it every afternoon in the summer. They don't understand lightning without rain. And so part of what I was trying to do is educate my colleagues to say, we need your help to find a balance here. And it, I think it was effective because I had, I had great turnout at the hearing from people that have nothing to do with West Coast fires, but yeah. they care a lot about human health. And so from a human health standpoint, from an economic standpoint, I mean, housing may get cheaper here because people aren't buying houses. I've yeah. talked to realtors who say people are walking away. That's not good. No, they relocated. I, I sold a house the, to this couple. They had lived in um, Eagle Point. They lived there for five years. We've had smoke, and it kept getting worse and worse every year. Then they finally called me up. We're relocating and they moved to Idaho. And I don't know if that's any better or not, but still, it's yeah, I don't not good. 
And they get fires too. Everybody's got yeah. fires. You know, the uh, the issue, do we have that slide on the fires on state protected land versus federal? Can we pull that up? So when you look at 2017, according to the Department of Forestry and Forest Service, it was about a 50-50 split on where fires started in Oregon. About half on state lands, about half on federal lands. But look at the difference in what burned. 95% of the acreage burned was on the federal lands. And you ask yourself, why is that? I just want to get to the facts. What's behind these fires that we're having? We can stipulate climate change, we can stipulate drought, we can do longer seasons, but the same thing applies to the state lands. The difference is, I believe, is different management strategies all the way through the process. They let it burn, and there's a lot of money from what I'm understanding, because I know people that are out there fighting the fires, how much money they're making, it's it's ridiculous. But yeah, we just so, got something different. So I, I get back to, I think we can, can and should do more to get in and, and do uh, fuels reduction. We know it makes sense. We know it reduces intensity of the fires. And if you don't go in after the fire, and by the way, they do this on tribal ground, they do this on state ground and private ground, where it makes sense to remove burned dead trees while they still replant a new forest. If you don't, all that fuel is there for the next fire. And we've had, I've talked to firefighters, I went out to base camp, you know, out here last summer, and there are areas they won't go into because of the, the snags from the prior fire make it too dangerous. So we lost a firefighter, I think, this summer with a snag from a prior fire coming down on them. Yeah. So you got a you got a firefighter safety issue, you got an environmental catastrophe in the making, and I just think we have to do more. We do. Thanks for your help on this. Thank you. <laughs> All right, now, are you 190? I am. She was 187. All right, they get moved here. Good morning. Good Tell morning. me your name. My name is Kathleen McNeil, and I'm a retired mental health provider and educator. Excellent. And first of all, I would like to make a comment about your pilot project for the veterans regarding using medical scribes. Oh, yes. That should ha be happening across the medical system to pay me the, number, the salary that I was making right. to write up notes when I'm trained to provide service. Exactly. Makes no sense. And so exactly. I hope. That pilot is successful and can be implemented across the, the health system because it would save money and lives, in my opinion. Thank you. <clears throat> the other comment I would like to make is that given our dysfunctional executive branch at this point in time, there are looming crises regarding Social Security and Medicare and our social su support systems in this country that Congress is not addressing, in part, I think, to the dysfunction and the allegiances that people hold on to to their parties rather than to the citizens of this country. I'd like to know what you and others within your party are doing to break this gridlock sure. beyond yeah. words. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So let me give you <coughs> concrete uh, results that we got in the last two years. And I think we will continue to get them because as Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, I worked in a bipartisan way with my colleagues on the other side of the way. Uh, uh, uh. Um, and as I mentioned early on, we passed 148 pieces of legislation, 93% of them were bipartisan on the House floor, 57 of those became law. And of the 57, the opioids work we did really was about 60 different pieces of legislation that we passed, and those were all but three unanimous, and the other three were overwhelming. Um, and then in order to deal with the Senate, with all due respect to our senators, um, you got to group it up because they can't deal with 60 individual bills over there. So we put it into one bill so they could handle it. We worked with the Senate, worked it out, done, President signed. We tackled some other things that I think are important. We fully funded community health centers for two years, complete bipartisan, done. Children's health insurance, um, it got caught up in partisan um, stuff over unrelated issues, I would argue. But at the end of the day, 10 years fully funded, that's never been done before, and I, there's bipartisan support for it. There were other, it was connected to other things people had issues on, but we fully funded CHIP. We took on the hearing aid industry. 
So um, I appreciate what you've done. I'd like to know what you're going to be focusing yeah. on to bring us through these real yeah. but, I, I but I also think it's important to know what we did because that seldom gets out. So you talked about Medicare. You know about therapy caps for physical therapy, speech therapy. They had been there and limit, if we didn't waive it every year, the amount of physical therapy a senior could get on Medicare. We worked together and got rid permanently of therapy caps. So now you as the provider can determine what your patient needs, not an arbitrary lid. So we did hearing aids, we rewrote FDA, bring down the cost of drugs, get generics into market quicker. Um, that was bipartisan. And there's more work going forward. Now, look, Medicare, we know as a Congress, both parties know, Medicare and Social Security, unless there's some intervention, is going, they're going to go broke. And when they do, already in statute, you would receive a 21% reduction in, in what you were expecting. That's in statute. The last time the Congress really came together on these issues dealt with the, uh, uh, the Medicare cliff, the payment <coughs> to uh, providers. And we made some changes in the program, both dealt with that so provi Medicare providers would get paid what they deserve, and we made some long-term changes to, to cut unnecessary costs in the program. Uh, before that, the last big Social Security rewrite was under Ronald Reagan, and Democrats and Republicans got together to do it. We know, it is no secret, that these two issues, Medicare and Social Security, are both a bedrock safety net for seniors, which I'm getting closer to after my birthday last week. Um, and they both need to be uh, modernized. And what are you doing to make that happen? They are both third rail of politics. That one party can't do it without the other. That's the history. So I think we have to look at how do you put Medicare on stable footing going forward. And there are ideas that have been put forward my party has, and we get our head handed to us. And I'm, I don't think that's the way you're going to solve this problem. I think we need to come together at the committee level and work it out. But I'm not here to say we're going to do X, Y, and Z, because as soon as you do, then you get your head handed to you. And so I am willing to step up and make these decisions and try to find resolution. I think states offer some ways to do that. I helped write the Medicare Part D. We're going to have to modernize it. There are issues there where, frankly, between the PBMs and the farm companies, some gaming going on on Medicare Part D. I'm willing to step up and deal with that because there's reform that needs to be done. Congress passed a fix on the donut hole issue um, that's cost the farm a lot more money. They don't like that, but that's what we did to save seniors. So there are these things, and I'd welcome your suggestions. What do you think we should do on those two fronts? Well, I think with Social Security, you need to look at how your tax reform is drawing money away from the, re the resources that we need. So you know that the, the data show on Medicare had actually extended the trust fund by a full year on Medicare. A whole year, wow. That's actually a big, that's actually a lot of money and a big thing when you're looking at the overall cost of these trust funds. It I actually mean, enhanced it. There, there are other things that people have also proposed in terms of raising the age at which you can retire and extend right. and furthering. But if we don't have the resources within our government through taxation to support the programs that we all agree we need, we're going to have smoke, economic smoke, that is going to inundate this country. And it's too bad we wait till the crisis is happening and people are hurting. People on Social Security who earn $865 a month, they cannot survive on that. If you cut that by 21%, you're going to have more and more homeless people and a bigger housing problem and right. bigger mental health issues and bigger health issues. We have to address these issues and we can't keep waiting. That's right. I fully agree we need to address it. We've got to come together to do that. Uh, number 171. You've already got Number 201. 
These were door prizes. I know they'd jump up. 166. Oh, sorry. Let me go back through. I, just, I don't want to leave anybody out. So I've done 201, 166, 171, 200, 190, and 187, right? Okay, here are the next three. I'll push those over there. Here are the next three. 144, 093, and 150. And the buzzer went off. So 144, 093, and 150. What do you have? What do you, what's your number? 150. Come on up. You do 150. Good morning. I'm Cheryl Reinhardt, and I am a volunteer and group leader of the Chapel Hill Center. And I would like to Yeah, if you could just get a little, yeah, there you go. I'm Cheryl Reinhardt, and I am a volunteer and cha chapter group leader of Citizens Climate Lobby okay. here in Southern Oregon. We're one of 500 chapters. Excellent. And we have talked to you and Riley and Caitlin and Nick in your district over nine years yep. trying to work on a policy to uh, address climate change and pricing of greenhouse gases. Right. And <clears throat> we have been working on a policy that's bipartisan and I'm glad to hear that you work in a bipartisan way and you value that. Um, so a policy has to be bipartisan to solve this problem. Good for people, good for the economy, good for the environment, and does not grow government. And it is here. So we have the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. It was introduced in Congress by both the Senate and the House at the end of last year in a bipartisan way. Three of your colleagues in the House were on that policy. Do you know the bill number on that? By chance? Um, HR 173. HR 173. Yeah. It is going to be reintroduced in the new Congress. We have assurance about that as soon as the government reopens. Actually, are you familiar with the Congress is reopened, but not well, fully organized yeah. yet. So. Are you familiar with the not in Not in great detail, though. No. Okay. So, when enacted, it will drive, uh, drive down the greenhouse gases, and much better than the Clean Power Plan, much better than the Paris Agreement. Yeah. Yes. And um, just yesterday in the tidings, there was an article of 45 top economists. It was originally a letter to the, uh, in, in the Wall Street Journal. And these economists come from all persuasions of politics. And they believe that the US government should have a carbon tax and return the dividends to households. And this is what the carbon innovation, um, excuse me, energy innovation and carbon dividend act does. So, so do you know what level of carbon tax it assesses? It, I believe this is, starts at $15 a, a ton the first year, and it goes gradually up. To what level? Until we don't need it anymore. Yeah. Every year it goes up until we don't need it anymore. And the key to this, it, it appeals to uh, Democrats and Republicans because the uh, revenues go back to households, and that's In what, what helps that? as a as a monthly check. Okay, so it's a redistribution. So not it's to a, those who pay, but it's to a every household equally. Oh, so this helps the middle and lower classes pay okay. for the obvious increase right. in fossil fuel. But you said every household. Every household in the U.S. So whether you're Bill Gates matter. or or Buffett no, or... doesn't matter. Okay. Helps to keep the economy. It actually improves the economy if you don't do anything. We've had studies done on it by the uh, uh, REMI, Regional Economic Modeling Incorporated. Mm -hmm. And we've had several other studies. We've been instrumental as the Citizens Climate Lobby in getting this bill going, as well as the Bipartisan Climate Caucus mm -hmm. in the House. So my question is, when it gets introduced in the House, 
would you be willing to support it? And if not, what would you like to change that about a bill like this mm -hmm. that you could support it? Um, well, I haven't read it yet, so and I don't know if it's been introduced yet. Uh, Not in the new sponsors yet. Weren't some of the sponsors last time defeated in their elections? Yes. Yeah. So, it's going to be reintroduced. Yeah. 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 Ted Deutsch will be, and and Florida. it will be a bipartisan. Yeah. And I think uh, Rooney is yes. been the Republican lead out of Naples, in, Florida. Yeah, Ambassador yeah. Rooney. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, you know, I, but there are going to be a lot of ideas put out. Um, Alexandra Acacia Cortez is been pushing. <laughs> Green New Deal. Um, that we're waiting to see the, the meat and bones on, on legislation. Um, I know that there are members of the Energy and Commerce Committee on the Democratic side that don't like the, the New Green Deal, but it's it's a little hard to know because it's never been put to legislative form yet. Um, and so we're we're having discussions. I'm just, I've not been an advocate for new taxes, including new carbon taxes. Um, I am an advocate for innovation. Um, I'm an advocate for renewable energy. I'm an advocate for investing in our labs that are doing amazing scientific research on battery storage and, and new technology. I, I worry about schemes that are about uh, economic redistribution like that um, because the government often takes a chunk of that along the way um, because somebody's got to redistribute it. Um, and I just, I, I, I think there's, there are other approaches that can be as effective. Because clearly, clearly countries that have gone down this path are not meeting their targets. As we know in China and India, um, the, the, under the Paris Accords, as I recall, India um, is given rate of growth of GDP and they're basically going to double their coal emissions um, and, their, and their carbon emissions. And that, so that's not working. Um, so I, I think there are other things that we've shown as a country where we've actually reduced carbon through innovation and new technology. Now, I know there are people who don't want any natural gas, I got that. But that has actually cut the emissions of carbon in half. And we can, as we work on, on new um, strategies for energy as well. But I, I worry what that does to the economy and the arbitrage, people will be in the middle of it and all the traders in it, and I, I just... So I, I think you need to look at the Climate Leadership Council Okay. That all it's all Republicans. They are lobbying this bill. They um, they, they uh, came out with it last year, and we heard about it at our conference last year. They are advocating the same thing. They say they, this this ec economically, as well as this report that's just come out Wednesday. Economically speaking, it's great, okay. and we need a big solution for this big problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 144. Well, now serving number 144. <laughs> Could you hold the onions? Yeah, hold the onions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm Gary Supply. Good. I'm Gary Jackson. I'm a business rep for the International Laborers Union, representing about 2,600 people in the state of Oregon. Oh, yeah. Pull that up, Gary. Okay, now, that'll get close. Okay. Anyway, I'm a business rep for the International Laborers Union, representing about 2,600 people in the state of Oregon. Uh, but also, I'd like to personally thank you for the help that you uh, uh, gave my daughter in uh, getting her uh, veteran's disability. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. It's an honor. Uh, <clears throat> but um, anyway, I, was, I guess I'm wondering uh, how are we looking on our infrastructure projects, you know, and, uh, and funding for that? You know, the, the bridges and highways in Oregon are failing miserably, uh, and uh, there would be a way to put a lot of people to work yep. with the good wages and uh, maybe help solve some of the problems. Yeah, you're right. Thanks, Gary. Um, so the happiest guy about infrastructure in America is one Peter DeFazio, because he's now chairing the transportation infrastructure right? committee. <laughs> He's, I think he got elected in 86. He's been waiting a long time to get a gap. And, uh, and, and there are a lot of pretty productive conversations going on, um, on on infrastructure. I was at a meeting in the White House the President convened last year. Peter was at, I was at, my counterpart, Democrat counterpart in Energy and Commerce, uh, Republican then chairman of the Transportation Committee. 
And as Mike Pence said early on, uh, yeah, I know there are people who aren't supportive of the president, but he is a builder. That's what he wants to do. And that's what he really enjoys doing. And so um, he is all in for infrastructure. And I think this will be a year where we look at an, a, an infrastructure package um, this year into next year. Uh, and there's a need in the country. Now, we did some things um, in the Energy and Commerce Committee. We don't build roads and bridges, but we do brownfields, we do safe drinking water, and we did some uh, uh, siting authorities for broadband build out. We did uh, for pipelines, for which I know there are issues here on, um, and for power lines, because that's all part of infrastructure as well. And so we're trying to say, what can we do to help move America and America's economy forward and, and get people good paying jobs? And, Certainly, we, we were successful as a delegation, House and Senate, in the last transportation bill being one of the mega project funds, which as you all painfully know, replaced all these overpasses that Oregon built uh, from a form poor or whatever it was, and it turned out it was a flawed system 50 years ago and they were all cracking at the same time. So I-5 and I-84 got all those replaced as part of the last big package, um, which is good. I know with, with Peter at the helm, we will not be left on the cutting room floor when it comes to Oregon projects. And so we'll see what develops. There will be debates about how you pay for it. Um, you know, there's a debate about the gas tax. There's, you know, experiments in Oregon and elsewhere about vehicle miles traveled. There are different ways to look at it. Fuel economy and electric vehicles and all. Um, there's a question about is a highway trust fund sustainable with the current funding mechanism that we have? Uh, we all want better roads, um, and less potholes, and less congestion, uh, and safe bridges. And we all know there's a, a problem that needs to be addressed here. The question will be, can we come together on how it's funded? So I, I'm optimistic this will be the year to do, I mean, this two-year uh, Congress will be the Congress to do the next big transportation package. I've supported those packages in the past, and hopefully can on this one as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, 093. We have 93. Are you, are you, either of you 93? No. I'm all 94. Okay, so close. And as Faye would have it, the next one's actually 194. Not 94, 131 and 141. So we got 194, 131. You raise your hand if you are. Coming down for a question of just leaving or going to the restroom. Um, you're coming down, all right. Do we have, and are you, what number are you, sir? 141. 141. Is 131 or 194 here? I wanted to ask a question. Okay, going once, twice. I'll call the next two while you come up to the microphone there. 128 and 151. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. If you can tell us who you are. And, I'm uh, Daniel Guy. I'm a member of uh, Rogue Valley Veterans for Peace. And I would like to know, Representative Walden, your plan and the plan of the responsible leaders in the Republican Party to deal with a belligerent, over-aggressive, reckless chief executive. From my perspective, I actually have a pretty good working relationship with the president and the vice president and his president. President's doing what he said he would do on cutting taxes and regulation. And when I disagree, if we could be honest, and when when I disagree, I express it either by my votes or by my statements. And, you know, I've caught, caught some flack by people I see in this room for voting to open some of these agencies. But the Forest Service BLM doesn't have anything to do with the wall. Um, and yesterday, I was one of 130 members of the House that disagreed with the administration on lifting the, the Republicans, disagreed with the administration on lifting the sanctions on that Russian oligarch. This is my, my choice, and you can agree, disagree. I am more effective for you if I am in the room and in those discussions at the highest level than if I throw a public rock and I'm never invited back. Because I try to work with people, I try to, 
I, you know, not cast stones. I try to just get the job done and be as effective as possible. Now, I never come in and I should issue a statement on every tweet and all of that. Um, but I don't, I just don't, it's not my makeup. I, I will speak out and I have. And where I've disagreed, I've either expressed it um, publicly or privately, which I think is always more important in a relationship, and in my votes. And, uh, you know, there have been a lot of them. And, and we agree and we disagree. And so I think, you know, that's, that's how civil society should work. I, yeah. This last November 11th was 100 years since the ending of the great original catastrophe of the 20th century. And I'm, I'm past it. I'm not going to be part of the, the next war. But now our sons and our daughters do now will, and I'm wondering if humanity will survive it. I'm speaking specifically of nuclear weapons and just, just off-the-cuff, reckless behavior. Yeah. Look, I think our, our strongest path to peace is being a strong nation and making sure um, that we can um, make sure our men and women in uniform have what they need when they are asked to go in and defend our way of life or prevent catastrophe of our own lands. And I would argue that the last administration um, did not do as much as it should have to make sure we have a capability. And I would argue that when the last when the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, pressed the quote-unquote reset button with Russia, it got us nothing but a stronger Putin. Amen. And the worst thing for the globe is a strong Putin. And I don't want the Russians involved in our country. I don't think they bring anything good around the world in the countries they are engaged in. And I'm glad we're, we're standing up and pushing back. I just ask more intermediate range nuclear weapons. What possible use are good can they be to anybody? Republicans are uh, are just deferring their decision making powers to Trump. And why? Why? I, I guess the question is why? Why don't they just try to do their jobs and put something in front of the president to sign? Well. As you know, I have voted on some of these appropriation bills. You, you know that part. They are sitting over in the Senate, and you have to get 60 votes in the Senate. And they have chosen not to take up these bills, and the President said, if you do, I'll veto them. And there's not the votes to override the veto. So we're in this um, box canyon. And I don't think it was, you know, people have to sit down and negotiate. And the best way to do that is find closed doors where you can actually have pretty serious discussions. I've been in meetings like that. And you work it out. I, I can only control what I can control. And that is my vote and my voice. And I've made both very clear on this issue. Um, but what's happening now is they're not even in this, uh, they weren't even going to be in the same country. Hell, you had members of the other party off in Puerto Rico partying and going to stuff last week. <laughs> No, it's, I'm just telling you the facts. It is the truth. It was a fundraising benefit for a campaign pact. That's what it is. I'm just telling you the facts. You don't have to like them, but they are the facts. And the point is, nothing's been done to resolve this. 
And that's why I have staked out a different position from the get-go. Because I think we need to resolve this. I believe in border security. For the and as I said in the meeting earlier, Chuck Schumer, Ron White, and Peter DeFazio, all of us voted for the wall in, in 2006. And most of us supported it when Obama wanted it. And Bush won, because we believed in border security and it works. Now, I, there's got to be a common ground here. But if people aren't going to stay and work and figure it out, they're, and that's about my big red. This is being done between, and it is Nancy Pelosi, because she's Speaker of the House, and it is Mitch McConnell and, and Chuck Schumer, and it's, it's Trump. And they've got to figure this thing out. And I wish they would. I wish they would. Because I'll tell you what, there's a lot of work not getting done. There's a lot of pain in these families that I'm sure I'm going to see as I go across Eastern Oregon over the weekend and next week who can't meet their mortgages. I mean, there are all kinds of situations going on here that don't need to happen. Um, and so I'm hopeful they'll work it out. But it's very frustrating for us, too. Is there even... But it's both parties. I'm just going to tell you, it in Washington, it takes both parties to get stuff done. Uh, in the past, there... If, if something sits for 10 days without a veto or without signing, does it automatically become oh, law? Can, 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 can constitutional law. Which can I mean, not take. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I, it, the president can sign, or I think he can let it go into law without his signature. Right? Do you really think this president's going <laughs> to no. take a pass? I mean, come on. Now you got all these egos going at each other, and you got the countries. And, and look, I, I've been to the border. I led a bipartisan delegation to the border. We have problems at the border. They're humanitarian. We shouldn't be ripping kids away from their parents. I mean, you know what? I voted. I actually voted to stop that in July, in, in June, and in the House. And how many? What? Still, still separated. We can get you a daily count. I don't have it at the top of my head, but I'll tell you what, in my committee, we led an effort that requires the Health and Human Services uh, Agency to tell Congress every week what that number is. And I was on the phone yesterday with the Secretary saying, your people are going to need to come up and explain the discrepancy that was identified in that report yesterday on how many were separated. But when... <laughs> but here's the deal. You, when you have this flood of people just coming across, oh. and they, and they, hey. now listen, we, we need to be civil in our discussion. I am telling the truth. I am telling the truth. I actually believe in facts, all right? And I went to the border and I get the reports. And the data show that people are coming across. We saw it. And as soon as you come across and say, I seek asylum, our laws, going back to the 1970s, say you have an opportunity to go before a court and have your case adjudicated. We don't have enough judges. And so the delay, they told us, is 10 to 15 years. Now, you can be here legally. Once you get in, you get all the rights and privilege under the law. And the law changed in the 1970s because a Russian sailor tried to defect, and we put him back on a ship, and they shot him. And we said, well, that's not right. But now, we're completely, the whole system's overloaded. And we need to fix our broken immigration system and secure our border. And I love the people Now we need to go on to the next person, so that was 120. And Greg, we're going to have to head on to Clown Falls here. All right, can I take, let me do two more. 120. And 116, 120. Yes, sir, please come on up to the microphone. Good afternoon. You may regret this. No. <laughs> um, Good afternoon. Tell me your name. Yeah. And where are you from? Pardon? Pardon me, where are you from? Uh, my mother. <laughs> All right, now I'm starting to regret this. <laughs> and my question is, I have worked overhead with the Federal Forestry. Okay. And with the ODF. I'm not a forest person. Can I'm I stop you? A person. Can I stop you? Tell us what that means when you say you worked overhead. I was an extra 
Let's put it that way. Okay. I was paid separately than the than the people that actually were. I thought maybe it was like air or something like that. Right. That's what I okay. Now, several crew bosses and several firefighters informed me that the Fed Forestry has a rule: let it burn. These fires were reported on your stats. They were reported by the media. And they didn't move for three or four days, didn't gain any territory, but yet they still burned. Yep. They took houses, they took property, they took overhead finances. They're screwing the American public. Something has to be done. Yep. And I spent a month in the house researching this because I couldn't go outside. Oh, it's awful. I've talked to so many people who are either housebound or hospitalized because the, of the, of the danger. Quality. This is not, you know, we, we spend enough of our lives as Oregonians with weather like we're enduring today and will for the next several months to be able to enjoy the summers and we're housebound or have to go. So I've talked to people that send their kids away because they have asthma. I mean, this is nuts. And I don't, I don't know if there's a policy that way, but it sure, I sure hear these stories a lot about how. We're not getting on these fires fast enough on the forest ground. And I think some of the, the chart, the data we have shows the amount burned. And I also know there are policies that say, well, it would be good to let this burn and reduce fuel load out there so we'll watch it. I've been pushing back on that with both the hearings I, I held and in my meetings in the Forest Service in, in, at the very high ranks, uh, in fact, about a month ago, saying, you have got to take into account the effect on human health in the summer when you're making that decision, and I don't know that you're doing that adequately. And my, my point is, yeah, control burns, nobody, I mean, I know nobody likes it, they are an effective management tool. When the weather's right, the smoke doesn't just sit in the bowl that we know is the Rogue Valley. But in the summer, that is what happens. And so they gotta get on them quicker, and they gotta put them out. Now, the state does it pretty well. State forest land firefighters, I'm told by those who do this work, they do it pretty well and, and a lot faster than I think you saw. Is this, oh yeah, the acres burned. There, there's something going on in the right side of this slide. We've got to figure out. This, but regardless of where you are in politics or anything else, these are our forests. And they're just going to be all blackened. And, and so I, I'm, I'm pushing them on the firefighting piece. I was told by the federal, by the ODF, that when there's a major fire, if it's on federal land, they let it burn. As soon as it hits ODF, it's put out. I don't think there's an excuse for this. Yep. And I appreciate your fighting for it. I, I've talked to people too who had firefighting equipment that they tell me sits around for a period of time longer than they think it should while they're waiting for somebody to approve the next thing. And time and again, people have said, if they'd just let me in there, I could have done X. Now look, I, I, I always back up a little bit. I'm not a professional firefighter. I know how dangerous these fires can be and deadly. We lost a wheat rancher in eastern Oregon this year who thought he could run his tractor out there and, and do a line, and he got caught and burned. And so I, I respect that. Nobody's talking about that. But something's going on here. The stats show it. And, and so we, we need, you know, we did, a number of years ago, um, we got together the BLM and ranchers out in Ontario in that country, because they were having a similar problem. Their problem was the firefighters would come from out of state and, and then take over and not know the lay of the land and burn fences and things that didn't need to be. And I said, can't we in the off season get you all together? And the end result is they now have these rural fire uh, organizations with pre-positioned equipment that the, the farmers and ranchers have and they are now in partnership. It's just like a, it's like a rural fire department volunteer, right? And they now, the, one of the ranchers that leads this, a friend of mine, he said, somebody said the other day, oh, you're not getting very many fires this year. He said, no, we're putting them out. You just never hear about them, and that is. And they've got some of these surplus military equipment that will go anywhere, big, tall wheels. They put tanks on the back, and he told me they were out on a fire, and the BLM truck said, um, why don't you go do that when we can't keep up? And so when we built this, this, so that's that's working there. It seems to me there are models we could incorporate that build on the best of what the state does and the private sector does to transfer to the federal sector. 
and get these fires out sooner, and then do the recovery effort afterwards. So I was also informed that when they let it burn, I don't know, this, this is rumor here, but the federal forestry supposedly gets time and a half for standing there letting it burn. I don't know all those payment schemes, but I do know we, we as taxpayers now spend more to fight fire than the, it's more than half the Forest Service budget now goes just to fight fire. And that's not what we should have. We should be able to use these funds to develop and, and maintain our parks and everything else they, they do. And that's such important work, but if it all just goes up in smoke, but we're never, it's, I don't know, it's, it's really frustrating. But I think, you know, Merv George and others have taken more aggressive steps to fight fire, not without controversy. They put a cat in the wilderness area to do a fire line, and a lot of people are unhappy with that. But you know what, it, we may have to rethink that, especially, do we have that, that one slide on the, the wilderness fire starts and all? I think it's 4% of Oregon's land is wilderness, but of acres burned, um, it was 32% uh, uh, is, is what burned. And, and I hear these stories, so I try and get the data, and, and it, I, you get these stories, the fires start in the wilderness, not much happens, and it roars out. And uh, so we gotta have either better breaks or better management or rethink how we, how we fight these fires. But I don't know about you, I don't wanna go through another summer like the last couple. I just think that I'm gonna like Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out. Um, regardless of our differences in political persuasions, let's all keep in mind we still live in the best country on the planet. So God bless you and God bless you.